Welcome to the Podcast for Inquiry, brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada, a national educational charity supporting your community for reason, compassion, and secular humanist values. You have answers, we have questions. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt, board member and secular chair for CFIC. Welcome. Today's guest is Julie Bindell, a journalist, writer, broadcaster, and researcher. She's been active in the global campaign to end violence towards women and children since 1979 and has written extensively on rape, domestic violence, sexually motivated murder, prostitution and trafficking, child sexual exploitation, stalking, and the rise of religious fundamentalism and its harm to women and girls. Julie regularly voices her opinion on TV and radio. Julie is the co-founder of Justice for Women, set up in 1990 in response to cases of spousal homicide in which men killed their female partners and were given sympathy and understanding by judges and jurors, in contrast to women who killed their male partners or ex-partners after suffering domestic violence and abuse and were punished disproportionately by the criminal justice system. In today's episode with Julie Bindell, we talk about her new book, Feminism for Women, which comes out in North America later this year. We talk about how feminism has evolved over the decades and the big lie that young girls have been fed about what feminism is. We talk about how men can help the feminist cause and what they should and should not do, as well as discuss uh, her contention that marriage can never be a feminist act and her own views on prostitution. I now bring you my conversation with Julie Bindell. Julie Bindell, thank you for joining me on Podcast for Inquiry. You've just published your your new book, uh, Feminism for Women in the UK, and it's available here in Canada as an e-book, but not as a physical edition. When when will that book be published in North America? Um, Sometime early this year, definitely before June. But keep an eye out and have a look uh, online if you're interested. And it will be on sale in Canada for sure and the rest of of North America. Um, Yeah, before the summer. Well, that's great. Well, we'll we'll give people a sneak preview of a bunch of contents of that book uh, over the course of of our conversation. So I wanted to talk about your book, Feminism for Women, but also about feminism more generally. Before we get into the details, I think it's important that everyone have a common understanding about what we're talking about. Feminism means different things to different people. So can you provide us a definition of feminism and the one that you use in in our conversation and in your book? For me, feminism isn't about equality, because that would mean that you have to be equal to the status quo and you don't challenge the status quo. It's actually about liberation. So liberation from patriarchy, by which I mean the oppressive nature of the sex class of men. So that means, of course, not all men. It means not every man um, oppresses each and every single woman. It means that as a class, men are privileged by being born with a penis and that every single institution on the planet, to one extent or another, privileges and favours men over women and it also means that you have to look at it as like for like so when people say but what about madonna you can't tell me that a homeless person of color a male homeless person um, oppresses and has power over madonna well that's true but if you take madonna's counterpart male counterpart then absolutely he will have more privilege um and there will be a tendency to favour and believe his point of view. And if you have um, a homeless person of colour who's a woman, she is more disadvantaged than her male counterpart. So it has to recognise that there is a male sex class and a female sex class, and that feminism should be about liberating women from the status quo, from patriarchy, reshaping society, as opposed to asking for a seat at the table along with the powerful, uh, privileged men. So, for example, when uh, women, and this is a very kind of um, North American 
tendency um, within mainstream feminism in the States, um, when women talk about the glass ceiling, often they're the women who are earning huge amounts of money, but they're earning a little less than their male counterpart and they're asking for equality. Now, those women are so rare in terms of the status that they've attained that asking for an equal salary to a very wealthy man will not benefit women worse off than her. It will not benefit poorer women. And male violence is a great leveller. So, of course, that woman at the top of her tree needs feminism because she's also vulnerable to rape and domestic abuse uh, and femicide. But it means that it has to be for all women. Feminism has to be for all women, even when all women aren't feminists. Okay, so most people that I know, when they talk about e- equality, they, they uh, you know, they're not saying that there should be an equal number of Madonnas as as male pop stars, or that uh, uh, that uh, th- there needs to be, you know, if there are more homeless women than there are homeless men, that that we need we need to make you know an equal number of homeless people of each gender. But they're talking about inequality of of, of opportunity that uh, that women have the same access to to education, same access to to good jobs, the same access uh, to promotions as as their like for like male counterparts, uh, and there might be some acceptable uh, variation uh, between the the results that that happened, but. But that uh, you know, most people that I talk that I've spoken with when they talk about equality are not saying that everything must be split 50 50 between men and women, but the op- the opportunities and the uh, uh, the resources must be available in in fairly equal measure to to both sexes. Yes, but that is assuming that the society in which women live currently under patriarchy, as I would argue, Um, is not flawed and doesn't need reshaping. So I don't want the same access um, as have men to the power structures available to them. I don't want, for example, to be given the same right to sexually assault men and get away with it in the way that routinely, in every country around the world, to varying degrees, men do to women. I don't want that type of uh, access. What I want is for those structures to be dismantled. But also when you actually look at having the same or the same opportunities as men, well, I'm very cynical about this because if you had 50% female politicians in our British Parliament, so in the House of Commons, and we don't, and I can't remember the... um, the percentage, but it's certainly not 50%, although it's significantly more than it was 50 years ago. Imagine if we had 50-50 men and women. Who do you think would shout the loudest, speak the most, be the most confident, be listened to, be favoured by the Speaker of the House, the person that decides who gets to stand up and make a speech and who doesn't? Of course it would be men. 50% female politicians would not render the House of Commons equal in terms of the voice um, or the weight of the opinion. So it just doesn't work. What we need to do is look at the way in which patriarchy has shaped the expectation of men where men do feel entitled. So I don't want women to be in a world where we feel as entitled as do men to pay for sex, for example. So there are there's a tiny minority of women who may, for example, female sex tourists, white, um, older women who might travel to the Caribbean um, and who decide that paying for a meal um, and giving a few dollars to a young black man because she's eroticized his race is unproblematic and it's not really prostitution. Now, I know that happens because I've investigated that. And I know that there are some very rare instances of women who might hire a male escort. But it's a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage because women have not been raised with the expectation that our sexual desires will be met 
whether or not there's a consenting adult at the end of that. And the justification of prostitution, which is overwhelmingly driven by men, both at the pimping angle uh, side of the operation and the John side of the operation. Um, I don't want women, the girls to be raised with that view that the human body, whether it's male or female, is a commodity. And at the moment, that is a very male attitude, not because boy babies um, are born innately abusive, innately violent, or with an innate sense of disrespect towards girls and women. Not at all. It's all about socialisation and and the institutions that favour them. I want to dismantle those institutions and those assumptions about power and control um, and not join in and not have women say, we want what men have. Because I want to remove that sense of entitlement from men and to be genuinely able to have relationships that are free of abuse and the expectation of dominance. That, that's interesting. When I was reading your book and, and I've read some of your other, your other work in the past, uh, your views on prostitution generally surprised me. I, I know that uh, pretty much everyone I know, they decry human trafficking and it, no one should be in the profession of prostitution against their will. That is a very widespread opinion. But most of the progressive people that I know, several of whom call themselves feminists, uh, they they accept the idea that sex work is work and that it is a valid choice and that the the answer to the very real problems of the prostitution industry is that it should not be, uh, we should remove the criminal sanction from it and we should remove the social stigma um, associated with it. Now, before Feminism for Women, you you published a book a couple of years ago uh, that was entitled the, the Pimping of Prostitution. So, can you elaborate on your position on prostitution and why your opinion uh, just seems to be very quite different from from so many others that seem to share the same goals that you have? Well, I would say that anyone on the left, and I would include feminists on the left, I think feminism has to be on the left because otherwise we don't believe in uh, the end to oppression from marginalised groups. So that's where feminism sits. And those on the left that defend the sex trade, which includes pornography, which is a kind of interface between uber capitalism, patriarchy and the worst type of racism and colonialism, you know, needs to look again. Because what you're actually supporting is an industry built on the misery and suffering of the most marginalised girls and women, and some men and boys, but in smaller numbers. And I know dozens of sex trade survivors across Canada, and I've done a lot of work across Canada with Indigenous sex trade survivors, because, of course, um, it is the most disenfranchised girls, and many of them come from Native communities and are abused into prostitution by white men. And what these sex trade survivors say is women defend prostitution when they are involved in it because it's a way to keep sane, to justify um, the daily misery. And of course, many of the women grow different personas, very thick skin as a protection mechanism. And that's the reality for every single sex trade survivor. In other words, women that have left or escaped from the sex trade that I've spoken to, and it's it's in the hundreds easily. And then, of course, there are some very atypical spokespeople that champion the sex trade, very atypical, by which I mean highly educated, middle class, articulate, non-drug using, non-alcohol addicted women and men who I call tourists. They nip in and out of high-end prostitution. They might do webcamming. Previously, they'd done phone sex line stuff. They might do some OnlyFans to supplement their doctoral studies or just as a way of getting down with the cool kids, um, of being a bit anthropological. Or there might be some gay men that run BDSM 
prostitution uh, services where there's no direct um, bodily contact. And those people, yes, of course, their opinions are valid and we should hear a range of opinions and we hear them a lot. So, in fact, we hear hardly any other voices than those that are the atypical tiny minority that pop up on our TV screens and in podcasts and, of course, they write books. They don't represent the millions of girls and women in the global sex trade that are there because they had no choice. Now, the issue of trafficking and distinguishing that from uh, from prostitution is ludicrous. Trafficking is nothing but a process by which to get women into prostitution. Trafficking isn't a thing. It, it, it's, it's spoken about as though trafficking is terrible. And of course, that means it's forced. But sex work um, is always fine and dandy and chosen and consensual. Well, without prostitution, without the sex trade, there would be no international pimping, which is what I call trafficking. There would be no rackets, racketeers um, of men and women who wish to make a fast buck off the backs of women and girls. Handily, um, we already have much evidence that removing all laws from prostitution is a disaster. Now, let me make it clear, first of all, we absolutely should never, ever criminalise a prostituted person a person who sells sex, ever. And I've been campaigning for the removal of criminal offences relating to selling sex for decades. It's unjust. It's a human rights violation. And it's actually punishing a victimised person. In the main, someone who had no choice but to be there. And I'm not talking about force. I mean, no other alternative. Or just someone who was unfortunate enough to meet a pimp and then became ensnared and then became addicted and then became traumatised, and then couldn't find um, the means to get out. But we should be criminalising the exploitation side of it, so the pimping, the sex buying, the johns, because it's a social ill, it's a a public health issue, it's a crisis, it's something that has a ricochet effect on all women in society, because men, because of course the johns are almost all men, develop an attitude whether they pay for sex or not, that there are some women for whom prostitution is good enough and others for whom it is not. And so for the left to support a system that has the worst effect on the most marginalised, the poorest, those with the darkest skins, the ones with the least opportunities, for them to support a system such as prostitution by putting a woman in front of them as a smokescreen and saying she chooses it, how dare you take away her right, is disingenuous and it's sadistic because it's not about her right. It may be for one or two atypical women, but we don't base law and policy on a tiny minority. What they're actually arguing is the right of the man to purchase the inside of a woman's body for one-sided sexual pleasure. And the consent is is only there, grudgingly, because cash has changed hands. So I'm not alone in this view. There are sex trade survivors and other sex trade abolitionists, those that want to see a world without prostitution, in every country where there's a sex trade, which means every country on the planet. And I think that we need to look at the way that often people defend prostitution and break down those myths. For example, it's not the oldest profession. Agriculture and midwifery probably are. It's not a profession. It's not work. It's not about sex. Listen to the sex trade survivors. Go to Holland. Go to Germany. Go to Switzerland. Go to Nevada in the US. Go to Germany, where they've legalised their sex trades where they have mega brothels and they literally market women as they would a beer and a burger. See how the death rates are higher than in those countries where they criminalise the demand and clamp down on the pimping, 
whilst decriminalising the prostituted person. Have a look in those countries with legalised regimes at how massively international pimping, that you might call trafficking, has grown. Look at the way that most pimps don't want to pay taxes. So we're still running illegal brothels, still running underage girls because they don't want uh, to register themselves or become uh, known as being pimps uh, and sex trade entrepreneurs. And then come back to me and tell me that decriminalisation across the board, including of pimping, brothel owning and sex buying, is effective. Because it isn't. It isn't safer for the women. And it means that we live in societies where prostitution is seen as inevitable, which it isn't. It's seen as natural, which it is not. And it's seen as harm, harmless, which it absolutely is not. That's an excellent defense of your position. Thank you. Coming back to feminism for women, in, in your book, you refer to the first, second and third waves of feminism. And I'm not sure that everyone is familiar with what distinguishes those three. So can you tell me how feminism has evolved over the decades and what the primary characteristics were for each of these waves of feminism? There's always been a women's movement, the last century and this century. And I suppose that it's become characterised as back in the early previous century, the suffragettes and the suffragists, which were fighting for the vote um, for middle class women as it began, and then to include all women. Um, but actually, you know, that this is not the whole story because those suffragettes, and in particular the suffragists, were committed to exposing male abuse and male power. And in particular, the harms done to girls and women, very, very poor girls and women who were being prostituted and sexually exploited by men. They also were looking at the way consuming vast amounts of alcohol gave men an excuse or disinhibited some men um, to the to the point of where they thought nothing about beating uh, their wives and other female family members. They wanted to expose men's bad behaviour towards women. And they've been mischaracterised as prudish religious zealots when, of course, you know, white Christian women uh, were the majority um, of, of any political movement in, in 19th century Britain. That's, that wouldn't surprise anyone. But these women were really radical. And then, of course, it came to the 1960s, um, in at least the global north, and women had had enough. They had endured, by then, of course, another world war, um, having a taste of relative freedom, and this is working class women I'm talking about now, who were able to go out to work when previously it had been frowned upon, even though working class women always worked. And when men were away at war, they realised that actually this was something that they could do and that they had been confined to the domestic sphere, being expected to be domestic servants and just raise children, and, and that, that the public space was not um, accessible to them, it was only accessible to men. And women began to talk about sex, about how they were sexually unsatisfied with their husbands, how they in fact were sexually repressed, how sexual violence and subordination was a very commonplace fact of life within heterosexual relationships, how, of course, celibacy or lesbianism or sexual freedom outside of marriage was not permitted for women, but it, you know, certainly men had much more sexual freedom than did women. And that along that, they also spoke about the fact that their lives were curtailed to a degree that they were really, as I said earlier, confined to the domestic sphere. And from that grew a movement. Of course, there were other things such as issues to do with 
sex equality laws, equal pay for women, maternity benefits, but they only really affected middle class women. The more grassroots feminism and the feminism that I came to at the very end of the 70s when I was still in my teens was, again, about that great leveller, the thing that affects all women and girls around the world. And it is, I would argue, the only thing that unites women and girls everywhere on the earth, which is the fear and reality of male violence in all its forms. And so I became involved in what is known as the second wave of the women's movement, but I just call it feminism because it's a feminism that makes sense. We wouldn't have the high rates of femicide, by which I mean um, the homicides of women and girls by men because they're women and girls. We wouldn't have the atrocity of almost normalised rape and sexual assault, even in countries such as Sweden and Denmark and elsewhere where it's supposed to be the most equal countries on earth for women to live. We wouldn't have a violent, misogynistic pornography industry that targets boys by the time they're about eight or nine years old. And we wouldn't have the domestic violence and rates of murder of women by men that are supposed to love them. If we didn't have misogyny, everyday sexism, and a society that condones the worst levels of misogyny. So that's the type of feminism that is known as second wave, but I think it's just a feminism that is urgent and obviously um, necessary for some time to come until we do end male violence, a project that has to be possible and that we should all imagine. Absolutely. I agree that the problem of male violence is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is a large one and that we're only starting to, to grapple with. You've stated that the motivation for writing Feminism for Women is that young women have been fed a lie about what feminism is. So you've you've given us what your definition of feminism is, and I think that's fairly clear. But what is the lie that uh, that young women have been fed about what feminism is? A reverse of feminism, an Orwellian version of feminism, where faux feminism, anti-feminism, misogyny even, has been fed back to young women in universities and other elite institutions as though it's good for them. So being choked during sex, learning to enjoy painful anal sex because their boyfriend might like it, and that this is a sexy thing to do, being spat at during sex. A kind of feminism, a faux feminism, that supports the sex trade and rebrands it as sex work, claims it's a profession, despite the fact that this is the last thing that they would want to do. And also a feminism that centres men, a feminism that would argue that pole dancing for exercise is liberating. A faux feminism that gives men a big platform, calls them feminists as opposed to feminist allies at best and actually at worst, these bearded dudes that decide that they can tell women what feminism is. And that's why I call that a feminism for men, because if it benefits men more than it does women, there's something really wrong. Look at, for example, slot, slot walk or slot march, whatever, whichever version you, you might call it, where in response to um, outrageous misogyny from a police officer who victim blamed a woman who was raped, decided that rather than do what feminists have long done, which is noisy protests through the streets, visible, um, colourful, vibrant and loud, shouting about male violence and how we will not stand for it and how we will take back the night, how we will end male violence, where we're shouting no to rape. Young women instead took off their shirts, fine, great, uh, but wrote in lipstick across their breasts, slut. 
started talking about being proud sluts. In other words, absorbed the misogynist message rather than speak out against it. There's no such thing as a slut. It's a man-made term. It's just misogyny. We can't reclaim that. There's nothing liberating in doing the master's job for him. And so those women were told that this is empowering to walk through the streets in public, in bikinis, labelling themselves sluts. No. That's what pornographers do. That's a male fantasy, at least the men that hate women. And so young women come to me all the time when I do public talks or when, you know, I get emails from them if they've read my book, if they see me on podcasts or whatever. And they come to me and they say, thank you for speaking out about what's fed to young women as feminism. Because actually we know it's not feminism. But when we speak out in our feminist society, usually led by some bloke, some dude with a beard who thinks of himself as progressive, wears a T-shirt with, this is what a feminist looks like on it. And that's all he does. When they're told that they're not allowed to question orthodoxies, such as men with penises who decide that they identify as women are perfectly safe in women's prisons, despite the fact that they are convicted sex offenders. When they say something really straightforward like that, they're told that they are transphobic bigots and shut up, you turf. And when they say that there's a rape culture, and this is reflected through the type of pornography that so many men consume, and boys, they're told that they are sex negative, that they are prudish. And so they're constantly shamed out of their instinctive feminism. And they tell me this all the time. And lots of young women in groups are talking to each other. Kind of anonymously now. I mean, they're, they're, they're meeting online where COVID allows their meeting face to face outside of their university settings, run by these faux feminists, run by the male so-called feminists. And, and I think that anything that suggests women should learn to enjoy humiliating and painful sex because men do is not feminism. So you write that men I want I want to talk a little bit more about men's role in in in, in feminism and and you write that men can be feminist allies and we could do with their help. And I'd like you to I- expand on that. Like if uh like what is the best way for uh someone, a man in, in good faith, how they can help uh, the feminist goals, or, or perhaps even more importantly, and you've touched on this already, uh, what should male feminist allies refrain from doing? You know, I know so many men in countries around the world um, that are doing this work that are actively anti-sexist, pro-feminist allies. And the one thing I'd say that they shouldn't do is expect to be Um, leading the movement. We don't need any superheroes. Feminism is about women. It's the only political movement that we have um, in the world that centres women and girls. Every other political movement, be it anti-racist or the labour movement, um, the disability rights movement, any every other single progressive movement centres men and boys, even if it doesn't intend to in the first instance, It always is tipped that way in the balance. So feminism has to not give men a seat at the high table and ask for his advice and his blessing. This is what women, this is what girls have been raised to do, to defer to men, to be quiet when men speak, to shut up when interrupted instead of insisting that we finish the sentence. And so what the feminist allies, the male feminist allies I know do is they work with boys and with men, maybe in education or in youth groups or in anti-porn and anti-sex trade campaigns. Um, And they speak as men to other men. They say, look, 
We know how this works. We were raised that way. We don't want to lose our privilege. It hurts. But if you want a fairer society and if you want decent relationships with women, and if you don't want to end up feeling really bad about yourself, um, for those men with a conscience, then we need to sort this out. We need to stop with the sexism. Stop making jokes about hookers. Stop making jokes about beating your wife. Have a think about your porn consumption. Does it? Because of course it does. Shape the way you view women. Does it give you a very clear message that women enjoy being gagged and raped? Is this affecting you in any way? The message that is constant um, that that men, uh, you know, absorb. And also have a think about the things that men lose out on by being an active member of the patriarchy, as opposed to rejecting male entitlement. They lose out on really decent relationships with other women as friends, as colleagues, as partners, as sons. And so there are some really great examples of men that do this, that actively campaign against the normalisation of sexual violence. But I do think that the more men that speak out, the better. And I applaud them. It's not easy to turn against your own tribe, which is what it feels like. Men have told me that if they're in a bar and they hear some really nasty anti-women jokes or sentiments, it takes some guts to actually turn around and say, that isn't okay. Why do you say this? Because you're not going to get a good reception most of the time. But actually by doing that, often men think, hmm, yeah, maybe maybe I am a bit of a shit. Maybe that isn't cool. But men should talk to each other as well about masculinity, about how masculinity is also a straitjacket in a very different way and with much more advantage, of course, than femininity is for women. You know, we all adhere to sex roles, sex stereotypes. They tend to benefit men and disadvantage women. But it's still a straitjacket for men because, of course, men get picked on by bigger, stronger men um, and it never ends. So we need to look at the way we relate to each other in this way and the role that patriarchy plays in that. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that it, a lack of respect, a lack of seeing other people as full-fledged human beings because they're not male enough or not strong enough or not macho or tough enough. And that, uh, uh, that does affect everybody and it affects, it affects relationships and, and how we relate with each other. Uh, I wanted to ask you about a Guardian video essay you did uh, in 2016 uh, and you said that marriage can never be a feminist act, and uh, also that women should stop pretending that marriage is anything but a tool for their own oppression. Now, <laughs> certainly, this can be true. Uh, there, there's no, there's no question. That there's uh, things like child brides or arranged or otherwise forced marriages are still distressingly common, um, even within fully voluntary marriages. Uh, neglect and abuse happen far too often. But there are also many women in happy, healthy, loving, and supportive marriages, whether their spouse is a male or a, or a female. So can you help me understand, given that, your claim that marriage is always oppressive? I'm talking about the institution of marriage, the state interference in a relationship, as opposed to a relationship between Many men and women that, as you say, can be extremely happy, very equal, really egalitarian. I've seen those examples. I have friends in heterosexual relationships. Some are married, some are not, uh, that have extremely happy, uh, good, solid relationships. But the institution of marriage is what I was critiquing here. Because it can never, ever rid itself of its original um, purpose, which is, of course, the handover of property and the transference of a woman from her father's care to her husband's rule. 
And marriage can't rid itself of those shackles. I don't understand why marriage is seen as a more legitimate state in a relationship than any other agreement between a couple. Why why is it that people marry as opposed to live together and ensure that as you do with your wills, as you do with any property that you own, as you do with any dependents that you have, that if you share things together, such as a home, that that will be fairly divided when one of you or both of you die. If you want to have a party to celebrate your relationship, why go to the state and the religious bodies to sanction it? Because what it actually means for women is that women are disadvantaged within that relationship. And research has shown less now because marriage changes as women's liberation becomes more and more accepted. Marriage is a state in which men are happier and more advantaged and women are less happy and less advantaged. And every piece of credible research has shown that it's good for men and it's less good for women. So even as the institution of marriage evolves, it used to be something uh, like in, 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 in England and Canada, primarily done through the churches or other, or almost exclusively through various uh, religious institutions. And now we, it's not exclusively that we've moved away and, and I, I don't know the percentages, but it's, as, as you said, it's both by uh, religious institutions and the state, you can have a civil ceremony without any, um, uh, without any religious overtones and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's no longer in inherently a, like a property transfer or a father giving, a a daughter away as, as, uh, to be the bride. And now she is, you know, his property to look after and care for, uh, you, you, you believe that the institution itself is, uh, irredeemably tainted by it, by its origins and no amount of, of reform, whether it's gradual or, um, uh, you know, significant can, can, can redeem it. That's right. And I, have always said that civil partnerships should be open to any uh, couple in a relationship and that marriage should be abolished and everyone should have access if they wish to civil partnerships. There is no, absolutely not one justification for the institution of marriage to survive because if people wish to have their rabbi or imam or priest at any civil ceremony that they wish to undergo, they can do so. But keep the state, in that respect, out of it. Divorce is often very bad for women. It's still stigmatised. Men will still, you know, still have um, the ability to contest a divorce, which is outrageous. I mean, it's far easier now to divorce, which shows... The, the great grounds that feminists have made. But the problem is marriage. In your book, you seem almost as concerned about class as you are about, about sexism. And that's my impression. And I want to know, is that is that an accurate assessment? Uh, it, does feminist liberation depend on the liberation of, of the working class? And what are, what are the interaction between uh, between you know the 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 class system that we have in in Canada and in England and uh and and your primary project of the liberation of women yes absolutely if we practice lean in feminism uh, which is the glass ceiling feminism the concern about already very privileged women on high incomes um being paid as much as their male counterparts and if we only look at the top of the ladder, uh, as opposed to the women in the basement, the women in the bot- at the bottom, then it's not feminism at all. Because the feminism has to start from the bottom up. The liberation of women absolutely relies on the liberation of the most disenfranchised, least powerful women. And we work our way up to the point of where feminism will 
absolutely benefit every single woman, including the most powerful, richest and privileged. If we do a trickle down feminism, then it will never reach those women at the bottom of the pile. And they are the women for whom patriarchy is the most brutal. They are the ones with less resources to leave a violent relationship. They're less likely to be believed if they're raped, although this affects all women of all classes, as does domestic violence. These women um, are far more likely to be prostituted and otherwise sexually uh, exploited. They're more likely to be the servants of richer people and therefore open to sexual abuse and exploitation in domestic servitude. And so it has to be for those women. If we think about, um, about working class women who populate the domestic violence refuges, who have no secure housing, those women that escape prostitution but can't afford any drug rehabilitation and there's none available but by the state, they'll be dragged back into that system of abuse. The most abusive men target the most vulnerable women, and that means the poorest of women, brown women, black women, indigenous women. And I'm really concerned about class because the left seems to have abandoned the issue of class prejudice and class discrimination, which seems really odd to me, bearing in mind that this is how the left was built, to challenge the ruling classes, to give a voice to the working people, working classes, those with the boot of the rich and, and landowning gentry on their necks. And so I want my feminism to speak as much about working class women as it does women in situations of power and privilege, relatively speaking, of course. I make no claims of a great, any great expertise on the subject of feminism. My consider myself, uh, my understanding prior to reading your book was that feminism was essentially uh, accepting women's equality in terms of skills, competence, intelligence, granting women equal opportunities in education, careers, and life in general. One line from your book was all it took to, to shatter this idea. Uh, and that, that is, legal equality cannot solve the massive problem of male violence. Uh, and, and that is not something I had truly considered, but when you consider the abuse and, and sexual violence, that, that of course that is, that, that is true. You end the book with, with the following line. Women and girls deserve a world without rape and abuse in which we are not raised to fear and avoid men's violence. That world awaits us. My question for you is, how do we get there from here? First of all, we have to imagine a world where there is no male violence, no rape, no sexual assault, no street-based harassment no forced marriage, no prostitution. We have to imagine that world in the way that people in the anti-racist movement imagine a world where people of colour are not routinely debased and discriminated against or subject to the violence of, of white racists. And we know that this, we know that people in other social movements do imagine a world, for example, without child poverty. They work towards that world. We imagine a world, if you take um, a kind of smaller example, although a huge, you know, again, huge health, public health issue. We do look towards a future where there is no addiction to tobacco. And we work towards that by removing the right for the tobacco industry to advertise, to peddle to children, all kinds of sanctions uh, alongside a um, public education and awareness campaign that, you know, smoking in public buildings is no longer acceptable. 
uh, if you look, I mean, I think that these, the, the sort of stopping smoking analogy is helpful because if you look at older films that you see or films made today, The House of Gucci is, is a great film that I saw um, a couple of weeks ago. And it's two hours, 40 minutes of brilliance in which about 2,000 cigarettes are smoked between <laughs> all of the cast members. I've never seen so much smoking in one film in my life and you really notice the difference because of course now nobody smokes in a film unless it's actually part of the story prior to smoking becoming stigmatized and I'm not talking about stigmatizing the people that were addicted or are addicted to tobacco but I mean stigmatizing the way that this is peddled pimped if you like to people um, including I mean mainly in poorer um, countries, we can see what great what a great difference it's made to to legislate against it, but also to have the public awareness and campaigning around it. You know, people started campaigning against the tobacco industry and against the normalization of smoking and this false idea that smoking was good for you, let alone gave you lung cancer, because their family members had died of smoking and they were completely avoidable deaths. Think about drink driving or even the requirement by law to wear a seatbelt now in a car and any other vehicle that you're driving or a passenger in. However many years ago, this wasn't a requirement. France didn't even have any alcohol laws when it came to driving until quite recently more people died on the roads. But what changes things is a combination of legislation and public awareness public education, widespread, funded and disseminated by governments, not just by charities who scratch around for a few dollars to run these campaigns. This is what we need. And look, looking at the, the issue of prostitution, I can imagine a world without prostitution in the same way as those that abolished the actual slave trade could imagine a world where people weren't legally and legitimately enslaved within that system. Obviously, we still have slaves. But the slave trade was abolished. And so legislation against murder doesn't mean that no one is ever murdered. It means that there are strict deterrents and sanctions and people understand why we have these laws. Prostitution is such a normalised activity that when Sweden became the first country, thanks to feminists, in 1999, to criminalise the Johns and decriminalise the person selling sex, the only reason why there wasn't a huge outcry was because there had been a build-up towards that legislation being introduced with the government and NGOs explaining why prostitution is not a harmless activity, about the numbers of women abused and killed within the sex trade, about the idea that men have an entitlement or even a need for prostitution sex, which was completely debunked, so that people began to understand that this law had merit. And then 20 years after the law was passed, there was a very different... Uh, response from the general public when they were polled, when there were surveys done about the attitudes uh, around this law, 80% of the country, 20 years after the law was introduced, supported the law compared to um, only 20% supporting it when it was first introduced. So we have to take a view that to end male violence means, first of all, we do not accept that male violence is innate or natural or that testosterone programs men to rape and beat women because it does not. We have to accept that behaviour can change and that boys and girls can be raised in a world where this is seen as an abhorrence as opposed to an everyday normal kind of occurrence. And we have to work at every single institution that allows this to happen. So that's our legal system, our political system, and every other system that somehow manages to promote the message 
that there are some women that ask for it and that men can't help themselves. But the legislation has to be in place and the implementation of that legislation. We have really great uh, legislation um, on rape in this in this country, in the UK. Feminists have shaped it to the point of where it no longer, for example, um, is acceptable, as it used to be before 2003, for a man to rape a woman and say, I honestly, genuinely believed that even though she was screaming, no, don't, I don't want you to do this, that she was just enjoying it and that I just had this honest belief that she was consenting. That now has been completely removed as a defence because of feminist campaigning. But we have to have our prosecutors committed to taking these cases to court because at the moment they're barely prosecuting any men for rape in this country right now. We have an under 1% conviction rate from reporting through to the end. Under 1%. Which means either 99% of women who report rape are lying or there's an awful lot of men getting away with rape. So we have to ensure that prosecutors prioritise these crimes as opposed to picking up women for not paying their TV licence and putting them in prison or jailing drug-using people rather than putting them on programmes. That's what we need to do and we need to be committed to a world where there is no male violence because men are not innately violent. It is learned behaviour. I think that's incredibly insightful. I find that your analogy to the tobacco industry from the 1950s through to today is uh, particularly apt because that was a multi-pronged approach from the Surgeon General simply making an announcement and, and publicizing it that smoking is harmful to your health to the warnings that uh, had to be placed on cigarette uh, 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 boxes in the cartons uh, about the harmful effects to legislation that uh, restricted where one could smoke and, uh, and enormous social pressure uh, from numerous organizations to bring that to bear. And as a result, they were successful over the course of decades. The rate of smoking in society in Canada and, and in the UK is vastly lower than it was, say, 40, mm-hmm. 40 years ago. But the tobacco industry was hardly passive during this, and they had a very well-articulated strategy of injecting fear, uncertainty, and doubt into the social conversation, disputing the research of the harms, disputing uh, the, the even the tangible costs. Uh, I, read, uh, I read one report where the tobacco industry was arguing that uh, smoking actually saves money for the health system because they die younger. So, and and the vast majority of expenses are for geriatric care and and, and keeping older people, senior citizens healthy. So, by dying younger, we're saving the uh, um, we're saving the healthcare industry vast that sums of money. That is obscene. I mean that that is like arguing. It it was it it it, it eventually failed, but it, it it did succeed in delaying a lot of the reforms that we see today for, uh, in their implementation. And and we see a lot of that today in in other areas of life, like in uh, like in in climate change, and and the the uh, there's a lot of social pressure for addressing it, but uh, the uh, fossil fuel industry is, is is fighting every type of restriction that might uh, mm-hmm. uh, put any limit on what they can extract and burn and and emit carbon into the atmosphere. As there is legislation and social pressure for greater uh, women's liberation, do you see any of pushback uh, similar to what the tobacco industry and the fossil fuel industry did with smoking and and climate change to maintain the status quo and not to have uh, not to have essentially equality and and to remove the uh, threat of male violence, which is, as you say, not inherent. What what are what are some of the pushback that that you have seen, and and how can that pushback be effectively countered? Well, of course, we have the men's rights movement, um, which we those that didn't realise that there was an anti-feminist men's rights movement 
um, in Canada, for example, certainly learned that there was one um, with the Montreal massacre when Mark Lepin uh, murdered 14 female engineering students because he hated feminists. And this was um, as a very extreme example of a man who had got very, very angry indeed at the strides that women were making and the fact that they didn't want to date him. So, you know, there's the incel movement, there's the men's rights movement that constantly write to um, Parliament insisting that as many men as women are victims of domestic abuse. It's an absolute disgrace that they are listened to when they have no credible research whatsoever to back this up. And the morgues tell the truth. The numbers of dead women compared with men who die at the hands of women tells the story. But we also have, and this is analogous with the um, tobacco industry tricks that you were talking about, the obscene tactics that they use, the Orwellian um, tactics, uh, message rather, that they put forward, it is used by the, the sex trade profiteers, by the pimps, by the brothel owners. They say that this somehow allowing men to have sex with whom they want, when they want, of whatever type they want, actually reduces rape. As though these women can't be raped. As though somehow if men don't let off sexual steam, in inverted commas, they will be forced to go out and rape a quote unquote real woman, which is what Johns have said to me in justification of their sex buying. The pimps put out all kinds of nonsense uh, such as is believed by many Canadians, that removing every single piece of legislation from the sex trade keeps it safer for women when the opposite is true. As I outline in my book, The Pimping of Prostitution. So that's the closest analogy I can see to the pushback because the global sex trade is a site of the worst male violence, abuse and exploitation by men towards women. And so I think we need to look at profit. The porn industry and the rest of the sex trade is just interested in profit. Not about sex, it's about the profit from women. And you tell men that there's absolutely nothing wrong with paying a woman for her consent and doing things to her that his girlfriend or wife hates because it's abusive. You tell him that that's okay and that's acceptable. You tell him that enough times and he'll do it. And who's telling him that? The pimps, the brothel owners, the profiteers. I want to be respectful of your time. And we've been talking for about an hour and I want to thank you. I've got one last question for you. Uh, in December of 2021, you wrote, and I'm just going to quote uh, one line from an article that you published. Uh, you, you wrote that, if I came to power tomorrow, the first piece of legislation I would pass would be a blanket ban on eating crisps anywhere other than alone in a soundproofed room. So I'm just going to take you on your word that that would be your first uh, piece of legislation. <laughs> My question for you is, what would the second piece of legislation be if you came to power tomorrow? A worldwide decriminalization of every person in prostitution and a criminalization of the purchase of sex. This would bring about a sea change, would serve as a deterrent and as a re-education for those men that have grown up with the idea that prostitution is harmless, doesn't adversely affect women, and it would mean that our boys would be raised knowing that this was a human rights violation not for anti-sex prudish reasons, but for progressive human rights reasons. That is what I would do. And I would possibly move the crisp eating to my second piece of legislation if I had the chance to do that. <laughs> okay, Julie Bindell, thank you so much for your time. Your book, Feminism for Women, is currently out in the UK, will be published in Canada and the United States uh, in the summer of 2022. How can people reach you online if they want to find out more, more about you? Um, I tweet at Bindle, B-I-N-D-E-L-J. Um, I have a website, thejuliebindle.com. 
and I can be found uh, on email, the address of which is on my website. Wonderful. And what's next for you? Your, your book has just been published. What's your next big project? I'm going to write a book um, that might surprise everyone, but I'm going to keep it stum for now. And I'm also doing a short podcast series um, about a very dangerous criminal that I've been on the trail of for more than two decades. So they're my first immediate project. Wow. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you for joining us on the podcast for Inquiry. Thank you for inviting me. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Links for today's discussion can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe and engage in the conversation. Comment, rate, and review. We'd love to hear your perspective. The podcast for Inquiry is brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada. We rely entirely on donations to be your voice supporting science, free inquiry, critical thinking, and secularism here in Canada. To our supporters, thank you. If you have not yet contributed, please consider making a donation at centerforinquiry.ca slash donate or becoming a member for only $30 per year at centerforinquiry.ca slash join. Your support will help make it possible for us to continue making our collective demand for reason and evidence-based decision-making everywhere. CFIC is on the web at centerforinquiry.ca. Find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at CFI Canada. Podcast for Inquiry is produced and edited by Matt Payne, Nikolay Nikitushkin, and Martin Zielinski. Music by Anthony Luzaro. See you next time.